Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. So Mary and Greg and I are excited to talk to you today about Deuteronomy in the New Testament. So um, before we get started, Mary, would you pray for us? Definitely. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for this beautiful Sabbath day and for the opportunity to come together and worship you through the study of your word. And we invite your Holy Spirit to please open our hearts and our minds and guide us to a better understanding of you and that we could share you with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So our memory text today comes to us from Matthew 4.4. 4. And most of you have heard this scripture, if not have memorized this scripture. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So when <clears throat> we look at the book of Deuteronomy, it's really one of the four books of the Old Testament, including Genesis, Psalms, Isaiah, which are the other three, that are most quoted in the New Testament. According to biblical scholars, Deuteronomy is the book that Jesus quoted the most, especially in crucial moments of his messianic mission. The reason for Deuteronomy's popularity has to do with the sermon genre in the book of Deuteronomy. It's an instructive one and a theological, has many theological teachings. Moses does not just quote the laws. He comments on them and brings their theological content and profound intention for the sake of applying them to the lives of the Israelites. So in he, the way he teaches, there's, there's very much a practical application that he is able to bring out in Deuteronomy. <clears throat> it also contains many teachings that will constitute the theological fundamentals of the Christian faith. We find in Deuteronomy the theological tension, the rigor between the law and the good news of great, the grace of God. So we see that balance in the book of Deuteronomy, the law and the grace. <clears throat> and so um, that is one of the other reasons that it makes it, it so popular. So let's look at a few of these. The law <clears throat> reveals, well, we see Paul drawing on the law revealing sin. And we see that in Romans 7. I would not have known sin except through the law. Then secondly, the righteousness is only by faith. And that we can see in Romans as well as Deuteronomy, where he says, the just shall live by faith. And then Deuteronomy says, the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, and you may, <clears throat> that you may do it. So we see... Uh, um, that comparison between the, two, between the two books. Jesus himself said, it is written. We see that in the New Testament. He said that the scriptures must be fulfilled. And when he was saying that, he was talking about the, the Old Testament. We see him telling his disciples this on the road to Emmaus. If you remember, <clears throat> when he was on there, he began with Moses and the prophets and expounded on all the scriptures that were concerning himself. And we see that in Luke 24, 27. Among the books are often quoted or referred to was Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah. And I had mentioned that earlier. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians, and First and Second Corinthians, Hebrews, the pastoral epistles, and the revelation all go back to Deuteronomy. Hebrews, the pastoral epistles, and revelation all go back to Deuteronomy. Many of the New Testament scriptures are often in the Old Testament. I know that when we have revelation study, one of the first things that we teach our students is how much of the book of Revelation comes from the Old Testament. So of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> 276 of them come from the Old Testament. In fact, more than 855 times we see references from the Old Testament in the New. So this phenomenon of comparing Old Testament and New is how we interpret the Bible. 
It's how we know what, it, what truth is. Because the Bible te teaches us to learn line upon line and precept upon precept. And so we see the themes that run throughout the Old and New Testament. And so it really solidifies what's truth for us. Um, <clears throat> so I want to read something to you um, from um, uh, Lift Him Up that Ellen wrote, White wrote. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the word as a whole and to see its relation of its parts. We should gain a knowledge of the grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world. Of the rise of the great controversy of the work of redemption, we should understand that the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the Great Commission. We should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience. Now in every act of life reveals the one or <clears throat> the others of two antagonistic motives and how, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he'll be found. And so each of us are, are the he here who is trying to decide which side of the controversy we're going to be on. <clears throat> Every part of the Bible is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The Old Testament, no less than the New, should receive attention. As we study Old Testament, we'll find living springs bubbling up the careless reader discerns only as a desert. The Old Testament sheds light on the new and the new on the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Christ is manifested to the patriarchs as symbolized in the sacrificial service, as portrayed in the law, as revealed by the prophets in the rich and riches of the Old Testament, Christ's life, his death, his resurrection. Christ, as he is manifested by the Holy Spirit, is the treasure of the new. Both old and new presents truths that will continually reveal new depths of spirit, of meaning to the earnest seeker. So this week as we move on, and Mary's going to start, we're going to look at It Is Written. Thank you, Barbara. So the first time Deuteronomy is quoted in the New Testament is when Jesus was tempted by Satan we're going to study that experience as recorded in Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to start reading verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How did Jesus respond to Satan's temptation? Notice, he didn't argue or debate Satan, and he quoted scripture. In this spiritual battlefield, his weapon was the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than, two, than any two-edged sword. What book of the Old Testament did Jesus quote from? Deuteronomy. Isn't it interesting that Jesus in the wilderness quoted texts that were given to Israel in the wilderness as well? Jesus repeated the words he had spoken more than 1,400 years earlier. In Deuteronomy 8.3, which reads, So he humbled you allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In this context, Moses is recounting to Israel how the Lord had provided for them all those years in the wilderness, including the manna, which was part of a refining process as the Lord was seeking to teach them spiritual lessons. And among these lessons was the one that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. 
In the book Desire of Ages, page 121, we read, in the wilderness, when all means of sustenance failed, God sent his people manna from heaven, and a sufficient and constant supply was given. God sent his people, excuse me, um, this provision was to teach them that while they trust in God and walked in his ways, he would not forsake them. The Savior now practiced the lesson he had taught to Israel. By the word of God, help had been given to the Hebrew host, and by the same word, it would be given to Jesus. He awaited God's time to bring relief. Now the second temptation, verses 5 to 7. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In this temptation, Satan changed his tactic. He referenced scripture too and used the same intro, it is written, but he misquoted. He referenced Psalm 91, 11, and 12, but left out the last part of verse 11, which says, to keep you in all your ways. That is, in all the ways of God's choosing. He focused only on the miracle and left God out. Here's an important lesson for us. Satan has studied scripture, but it does him no good. Beware, for it's possible to know the scriptures well and quote them all the time, and yet ignore or even reject the God who inspired them. We must have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, transforming and renewing our minds and hearts. He must open God's word to us, so that it can be a life-giving and life-changing force within us. Now back to Jesus' response to Satan. He quoted from Deuteronomy 6.16. This is his response. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Notice Jesus focused on God, whom alone we should worship. He quoted where Moses again reminded the people of their rebellion at Massa or Rephidim. In Exodus 17, 1 to 7 is the story. The Israelites had set up camp at God's direction where there was no water. They complained and scolded Moses, indirectly complained and scolded God, and demanded water. They even asked, is the Lord among us or not? From Desire of Ages we read, God had wrought marvelously for them, yet in trouble they doubted him and demanded evidence that he was with them. In their unbelief, they sought to put him to the test, and Satan was urging Christ to do the same thing. We should not present our petitions to God to prove whether he will fulfill his word, but because he will fulfill it. Not to prove that he loves us, but because he loves us. When trouble comes our way, how do we respond? May God help us remember to not tempt him as he was tempted in Massa. Now we're at the third and last temptation. In verse eight we read, again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Here, Satan shows his true character. He presents before Jesus the kingdoms of the world and all their fullness of glory, luxury, and abundance in panoramic view. He wants worship and from God himself. But Christ would not be bought. And once again, quoted from Deuteronomy 6.13, where the Lord is warning the Israelites of what will happen when they are living in the land flowing with milk and honey, in houses full of good things, and when you have eaten and are full. Jesus said to beware of worshiping other gods. Through Moses, he tells them, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, meaning 
you shall not bow down and worship anyone or anything beside him. So what important lessons have we learned in order to resist Satan's temptations? Scripture is our only weapon. We must ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with his word and let it empower our lives. And don't engage in debate or discussion with the devil. Let God's words rebuke him. I'd like to conclude with sharing this quote from Desire of Ages, page 123. By what means did he overcome in the conflict with Satan? By the word of God. Only by the word could he resist temptation. It is written, he said, and unto us are given exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's in 2 Peter 1, 4. Every promise in God's word is ours by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God are we to live. When assailed by temptation, look not to circumstances or to the weakness of self, but to the power of the word. All its strength is yours. Thy word, says the psalmist, have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Ask God to hide Deuteronomy and the rest of the scriptures in your heart. Thank you. Now, Greg, you have a very interesting topic. Lifting up faces. I do. I thought it was interesting because I, I wasn't quite sure where they were going to go with this, but I thought it was, it's worth the, uh, the discussion and the, uh, the research. All right. So share us with us what you've discovered. I sure will. And uh, good morning again, everyone, and happy Sabbath. And Monday's lesson, as Barbara had mentioned, is called Lifting Up Faces. And that comes from the phrase in Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19. So let's just read that. So join me in opening your Bibles or you can follow on your screen. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So the term shows no partiality is translated from a Hebrew figure of speech, meaning that he, God, does not lift up faces. And that is believed to have come from a legal setting in which the judge or king sees the face of a person who's on trial. And based on that person's status, being either an important or unimportant person in status, the judge or king would then render their verdict. So the implication or point in the passage of Deuteronomy is that God does not treat people in this manner. Thank God he doesn't treat people in this manner. God treats us all fairly, one just like another, regardless of our social status. And Jesus lived this example in his life by showing how he treated even some of the most undesirable people. And if you could think of some of those in in Scripture, some of the undesirable people included tax collectors. I don't think they're necessarily considered that today because it's a profession and it's not as, as controversial as it was back then. Adulteresses and even the poor and needy. And Christ even said, you'll always have the poor with you. So this continues not only from the Old Testament, but all the way through the New Testament and through today's time. But let's read a few passages from the New Testament that address this same principle of God and Jesus and the principle of impartiality. So let's begin with Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. So Peter confirms this too. In Romans 2, 11, we read, For there is no partiality with God. When you actually read all of Romans 2, Paul makes it very, very clear that in God's righteous judgment, in salvation and condemnation, there is no difference between Jew and Gentiles. Let's now move to Galatians 2.6, which reads, But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows pers personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. 
So again, Paul is making it very clear that, uh, that God shows no partiality. And if we go to Ephesians 6, verse 9, And you, masters, do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So again, Paul is telling masters, or you could think of it in today's terms as bosses, anybody who has authority over someone else, whether it's in the workplace or, or anything else. Paul is being very clear to say, don't treat them unkindly. Don't treat them with partiality. Treat them with impartiality the way that God does. Let's look at Colossians 3.25 as well. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. So it really comes down to it's our personal responsibility. It doesn't matter who you are in society or in this world. And we'll take a look at the last verse, which is 1 Peter 1.17. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. And the Hebrew word for fear is phobos. And phobos, it can mean fearful with terror, but it can also, in a different context, mean with reverence. So what's being stated here is we need to live in reverence to God and to Jesus. So from the verses that we read, we just read, I believe, seven verses. Can you see how these passages all relate back to Deuteronomy 10, 17, which is that God does not lift up faces. He doesn't um, view people with partiality. It's, he's impartial. And if you think about it, if God, if Jesus lived these examples for us and how he treated one another, shouldn't we do the same? But the question is, do we? And I would say not always. And some of you may do this, and if you do, then God is blessing you and working immensely through you. I know that I falter more often than I would like to. And so what are we to do? What is it that we're supposed to do? And it reminds me, I just want to give just one very brief example, because this touched me about six months ago when I came across it online. And it's this uh, very famous longtime actor, and I don't usually like to quote anybody who is um, a celebrity. Um, the heck, I'm going to give him credit because I think credit is well deserved. Uh, Denzel Washington was giving a commencement speech to the graduating class. I don't recall which university it was. But people would come up to him and say, Denzel, Denzel, Mr. Washington, I want to be just like you. I want to be just like you. And he said, really? You want to be just like me? He said, yeah, what do I need to do? He says, what you need to do is before you go to bed, the last thing you do is you take your slippers off, you put them as far underneath the bed as possible so that when you wake up in the morning, the very first thing you do is you drop to your knees and you give thanks and praise for the blessings that God gives you and you ask and pray for him to guide you and direct you. And when I heard that, I thought, you know what, that's today, real day time that he's taking and expressing to a class. So I just wanted to share that with you. We all need to ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit to dwell within each of us to change our hearts and our minds from a worldly perspective to ways that are his ways. That's what Deuteronomy was all about. Deuteronomy was a plea from Moses to the Jewish people saying, you need to change your hearts and your minds. Stay with God. And so the next time that any of us, in a practical sense, the next time any of us see, whether it's a homeless person or anybody else whom society would consider to be undesirable, whether they're here at church, whether they're at your workplace, whether they're walking up and down your street, but it's to treat them with equal kindness and with respect as we would treat anybody who would be of high affluence or notoriety. But when we have employees and workers, I think we often tend to be a little bit um, hard on them. And so I think that's also an example for us to think of how to treat them if our situation was reversed, 
we would want them to treat us with respect as well, without partiality, without what car we drive, without um, what our status or title is uh, within our workplace. So the thing is, we can't do that on our own. It's not possible for us to do it on our own. Our own sinful nature works against us. So we need to draw to our knees. We need to ask the Lord to help us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he can help change our hearts and his mind to reflect his. So regardless of our status, whether we are high or low or somewhere in between in status in this world, we are all offered salvation in Jesus Christ equally. And because God shows no partiality, he shows no lifting up of faces. So I hope that this has given you maybe just a practical sense of what that term means. And so with that said, I will turn it back over to Barbara. Thank you. We're going to now talk about <clears throat> um, cursed on a tree. And in this, we're going to talk a bit about literally where uh, Paul says in Galatians, talks in Galatians about Christ being <clears throat> hung on a cursed tree and also about justification by faith. So the scripture's a little bit long, so we're going to jump in here at verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So which one is it? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So if we're going to be sons of Abraham and God's chosen people, we have to have live with the same type of faith. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel of Abraham beforehand, saying, in all nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are the works of the law under, <clears throat> are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God <clears throat> is evident, for the just shall live by, by faith. So that's a mouthful. So we are not saved by the law, but yet we are justified <coughs> in Christ. And in doing so, we live by faith and keep the law. Yet the law is not faith, but the man who, de who does them shall live by them. We see that again. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now this whole concept of being cursed by hanging on a tree <coughs> was something that I had to do a little bit of research on, so I'm going to share it with you. And it comes from where I'm bringing, taking this from is Matthew Henry, Henry's Bible Commentary. So, in, in that, we see that a law forbearing of the bodies of malefactors that were hanged, we see this in Deuteronomy 21, 22, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, he is to be put to death, and you hang him on a tree. The hanging of them by the neck till the body was dead was not used at all among the Jews, as with, <clears throat> but... What they used was uh, stoning them to death if it was blasphemy or some other crime. It was usual by order of the judges to hang the dead bodies upon posts for some time as a spectacle to the world to express the ignominy of the crime and to strike the greater terror in others. So not only was this because you, you had done a horrible crime, but they wanted others to realize the consequences of that, of, of um, living 
of, of committing crimes, that they may not only hear in fear, <coughs> but see in fear. Now it is here provided that whatever time of day they were hang on the tree, at sunset they should be taken down and buried, and not left to hang all, out all night. Sufficient, says the law, to such a man this punishment. Hitherto let it go, but no further. So the malefactor and his crime be hidden in the grave. So let's look at some reasons for this as to why they would do this. First of all, <clears throat> God would thus preserve the honor of the human bodies and tenderness towards even the worst criminals. The time of exposing dead bodies thus is limited for the same reason that the number of stripes was limited by another law, lest the brother seem vile unto thee. Punishing beyond death, God reserves for himself. As for man, there is no more that he can, we can do. Yet it is plain, this is the second one, that there is something ceremonial in it. By the law of Moses, the touch of the dead body was defiling. And we see that in the laws of Moses. Therefore, dead bodies must not be left hanging up in the country because by the same rule it would defile the land. A third reason um, here is given in reference to Christ. He that is hanged is accursed of God. That is, it is the highest degree of disgrace and reproach that can be done to a man and proclaims him under the curse of God as any external punishment can. Those that see him thus hang between heaven and earth will conclude that he was abandoned both by earth and by heaven. Therefore, <clears throat> let him not hang all night, for that would carry it too far. Now the apostle, showing how Christ was re redeemed us from the curse of the law by, by himself being made a curse for us, illustrates it by comparing the brand here put on him that was hanged on the tree with the death of Christ. And we see that we've seen that in, in Galatians 3.13. Moses, by the Spirit, uses the phrase of being accursed of God when he seems no more than being treated most ignominiously, that it might afterwards be applied to the death of Christ and might show that in it underwent the curse of the law for which is a great enhancement of his love and great encouragement of faith in him. So now, and then the fourth reason, um, this passage is applied to the death of Christ, not only because he bore the sins and, exposed, and was exposed to shame as these malefactors were that were accursed of God. And we remember there was a malefactor uh, by Christ who was truly a criminal, and they chose to let him go. But he was in the evening, evening taken down from the cursed tree and buried before sunset, and it demanded no more. So we see that um, that that whole issue around this curse that Christ took for himself and uh, put upon him. This curse was really deserving we were deserving of christ wasn't deserving of so by doing this the church is washed and cleansed by the completion the complete satisfaction which christ made in doing this act so also um paul says in deuteronomy 27 26 cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of the law by observing them and all the people say amen Unfortunately, it is common in Christianity to use this letter as some kind of justification for not keeping the law or the Ten Commandments. Of course, that argument is really used as a reason not to keep the commandments, especially the Fourth Commandment, as, that, um, <clears throat> as if that one commandment, as opposed to the other nine, somehow is an expression of legalism that Paul was dealing with at the time. Yet Paul was not speaking against the law, and certainly nothing in the passage would justify breaking the Sabbath commandment. The key can be found in Galatians 3.10, where he writes, All who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. 
Then he quotes Deuteronomy 27, 26. The issue isn't obedience to the law, but relying on the law through a, a tough position, if not an impossible one. Paul's point is that we are not saved by the works of the law, but by Christ. And so as we go through this, this, this lesson and, and learn that symbol, it's amazing to me that this whole issue of being hung on the cross as a curse, as a shame, is, is just, it overwhelms me because Christ did that for us. It's something that we deserved and he did for us. So, um, but we can live by faith as Abraham did and be justified. Thank you, Barbara. You're going to be talking about a prophet like unto us? Yes, Okay. I am. And we're going to begin by reading first Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 20, where Moses is again speaking to the Israelites. And he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. What is Moses telling them? Is he referring to the future coming of prophets in general or to a specific prophet? This text here is in reference to the covenant at Sinai in which Moses talks about how the children of Israel at the revelation of God's law wanted Moses to act as a mediator, an intercessor between them and God because they were scared of the physical manifestations of God at Mount Sinai. This is recorded in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 21. It is then that Moses promises them twice that the Lord will raise up a prophet like him, like Moses, the idea being given the context that this prophet, like Moses, also will be, among other things, an intercessor between the people and the Lord. So many centuries later, both Peter and Stephen quote this text in reference to Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to Acts 3.22. And there it says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. So Peter is speaking here and has just performed a miracle at the temple. He spoke to a lame man and said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man begins to walk and jump for joy. The crowds at the temple recognize the lame man and now surround them. And Peter addresses them all and proceeds to say that the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, glorified his servant Jesus, whom they gave to the Romans to kill, but that God had raised him from the dead, and that it was the name of Jesus and faith in his name that had healed the lame man. Then he quotes from Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Peter is seeking to prove that Jesus is the fulfillment of what had been spoken of by all the holy prophets. In fact, the people were so familiar with the expression, I will raise up a prophet that when Jesus performed the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves of bread, the Jews immediately remembered the miracle of the manna and thought that the prophet like Moses had come. That's recorded in John 6, 14. 
So now Peter is using this familiar text and applies it to Jesus. Next, let's read Acts 7, 37. And it says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Stephen is now speaking here. So who was Stephen? In Acts 6, it says he was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He was also one of the first seven deacons chosen to help in the daily ministrations of the church. So what's the context of this story? In chapter 6, certain men of various synagogues started disputing with Stephen and weren't able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So they induced men to lie and say they had heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So this stirred up the people against Stephen, which gave them cause to bring him in for questioning before the Supreme High Court, the Sanhedrin. It's during this questioning that he rehearses the history of God's chosen people. He showed a thorough knowledge of the Jewish economy and the spiritual interpretation of it now made manifest through Christ. And he repeated the words of Moses that foretold of the Messiah. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. He too is connecting Jesus with the prophecies and claiming that Jesus is the one that Moses and all the prophets were pointing to as the direct fulfillment of what God had promised through them. So how is this relevant to us today? Why is it important for us to know what Moses prophesied regarding the Messiah, and what other prophets prophesied. Because as we study the fulfillment of these prophecies in the life of Jesus, especially as recorded in the New Testament, our faith will grow in him. Remember that Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 4 and 5. He said, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And again he said in verse 24 of Matthew 24, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. It's absolutely imperative that we ask the Holy Spirit to open God's word to us so that we may learn from it ourselves, as it is our privilege to learn from it and be convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And with that, I will hand that over to Greg. Greg, Greg, a fearful thing. A fearful thing. So that is Thursday's <laughs> lesson titled, A Fearful Thing. And we're going to begin by looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 through 31, and we're also going to see how Paul refers back to and quotes Deuteronomy to what they call exhort, which is to strongly encourage, but it's not to mandate, it's to strongly encourage Jewish believers and all of us who follow those believers back then in Paul's time to stay faithful to the Lord. Otherwise, the consequences are not good. And as the title says, it would be a fearful thing. So let's begin by reading Hebrews chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So what is Paul saying here? Let's 
unpack this a little bit. We'll just go verse by verse here. In verse 28, which is uh, he despised Moses' law, um, he who despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So how many witnesses were needed to convict a person to a physical death in the Old Testament? Two or more, two or three or more witnesses. Paul is referring back to Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So that's why Paul's referring back to Deuteronomy. So how many witnesses are needed for conviction of spiritual or eternal death? Just one. That witness is Jesus Christ. Let's move to verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye that uh, ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So how much sore the punishment? Sore in the Greek is chiron. That's pronounced chiron. And it can mean worse and worse, or a worse thing. So Paul's saying, this is a worse thing. Punishment in the Greek is the noun timorea. And timorea means penalty. And what is a penalty based on? Well, a penalty is based on a decision or a judgment that's rendered as a consequence of an action or an inaction. So Paul is saying that we suffer the consequences of our own actions or our own decisions. We're talking about those who, by freedom of choice, our own freedom of choice, rejected Jesus and hath done despite the Holy Spirit. So, hath done despite the Holy Spirit. This, I thought, was really interesting. In the Greek, the verb for despite is inubridzo, inubridzo, and that means to insult. So that's to essentially insult the Holy Spirit, which is really synonymous with the unpardonable sin that is stated in Matthew 12, 31, which is, therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. So why is Paul saying this? Why is he telling us this? And what's wonderful is he gives us the answer in the very next verse which is verse 30 and it begins with for we know him for we know him that hath said vengeance belongeth unto me i will recompense saith the lord so there he's referring back to deuteronomy 32 verse 35 which states vengeance is mine and recompense their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. So, what Paul is saying here to those Jewish believers and to us today is, we have no excuses. We have no excuses. We have a fuller understanding of God's love for us as revealed at the cross through Jesus Christ than those before us. So again, Paul is saying, we're without excuses. Why? Because for we know him. And we know him. The Lord shall judge his people is how that verse finishes. So if you think about that, for we know him and then the Lord shall judge. So that's why Paul is saying, how much sore could that be? In other words, how much worse can that be? You've, you've known, you've seen a complete picture of this. There's no excuses, right? So when the Lord shall judge his people, which is how the verse ends, who shall judge and repay? Who does the judging? The Lord. And how does God repay? He doesn't repay saying, okay, you did this, and so I'm going to punish you that way. In the judgment, God determines who accepted or rejected him, those who are either lost or saved. And those who reject the Lord will hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 7.23 which is, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And that would be a fearful thing. 
And then lastly, in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, the word fall in the Greek is the word empipto. And according to the Greek lexicon, this can mean falling into one's power. And in this instance, we're talking about falling into the power of God to incur divine penalties or results or consequences. So again, does this mean that God is going to penalize people for their unbelief? Or is God simply allowing the results to be manifest in the decisions we make of our own choice by rejecting God and rejecting Jesus and God simply withdrawing his protection, his grace, his mercy, his blessings, and ultimately his breath of life, his ruach. So this is a judgment that is based upon our decisions. It's the consequence of our own free will of rejecting Jesus what he had done for us at the cross, and what he is doing for us now in the heavenly ministry. So how we make our decisions about God are usually based on how we view God. We either view God as a God of love, as expressed through John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or do you view God as a tyrannical God of legalistic punishment that unfortunately some Christians believe today. Well, I would say this. God doesn't want anyone to perish. And he gives us proof of that in Matthew 18, verse 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He wants none of us to perish. And in 1 Timothy 2, 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, of God our Savior, who desires all men, to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of truth. So in conclusion, Moses understood the love of God. Paul understood the love of God and the love of Jesus as well. They both understood the importance of remaining loyal to God. And Paul was essentially pleading with the Jewish believers back then and us today, each one of us, to stay faithful to God so that we don't hear those what I consider to be the most anguishing, sorrowful words that we could ever hear, which is away from me, I never knew you. We don't want that to happen. God doesn't want that to happen. He wants us all to be saved because if not, that would be a fearful thing to hear those words from Jesus. So I'll give it back to you, Barbara. Mary, do you have any final thoughts? Um, And just that reiterating how important Deuteronomy is memorizing God's word through the Holy Spirit when we are tempted. This is where we need to turn to. And that this word also tells us with certainty who the Messiah is, that he was prophesied in the Old and the New Testament. Only Jesus fulfilled that. Thank you. Any other thoughts, Greg? I just walked away with the study of Deuteronomy with being more blessed than I ever have been before by studying it. So I'm, I'm grateful and hopefully you have been as blessed as well. Thank you. So I really think to, to conclude this, we need to really go back and think about righteousness by faith. And in Ellen White's biography, she talks about why righteousness by faith is so important. She says, justification by faith, the foundation of truth of salvation through Christ, is the most difficult, get this, most difficult of all truths to keep in the experience of the Christian. It's easy to profess, but elusive in application. First of all, we need to remember it's a personal matter. Only by individually beholding Jesus and laying claim upon the promised merits of the risen Savior can the experience be enjoyed. And secondly, the experience is one that must be renewed daily and maintained by keeping our eyes on Christ. It can be, it can't be had and enjoyed today and lost tomorrow. So as we struggle with faith, our fight is the fight of faith, isn't it? It's daily coming to the cross. Amen. It's daily doing what Christ did. He went back and started in the Old Testament. He went back to Deuteronomy. 
and he showed his disciples all the way through I am Christ I am the promised one and that's where this time in the in the book and memorization as, as Mary talked about is so important in maintaining our faith so Amen. let's pray dear father in heaven thank you for this wonderful lesson in Deuteronomy father it's amazing to realize how intertwined your Old and New Testaments are, how it is so blessed and shared between the Old and the New. Father, we pray that we will hang on, that that fight of faith that we fight daily, you will work with us, be with us, pray with us, hold us up, as we study and fight that fight of faith. We pray that you would strengthen us in our faith every day, Lord, and that your righteousness will shine through in everything we do and say. So thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.